So thanks so much for the intro. I don't have to spend any of my time on the intro, uh, but uh, I will. Uh, uh, I will talk a bit why, why actually why am I talking about this? And I have a long uh, a long history with pricing, uh, both both good history and bad history. Uh, in my first in my kind of the company I founded, uh, we we both did some really cool stuff. Uh, uh, like we introduced uh, desktop software uh, subscription in 2009. We were one of the trailblazers in our, in our industry. Uh, there was a lot of uh, pushback, but also uh, it was in the end very valuable decision. But also we did some stupid stuff uh, and we increased the prices to move to enterprise sales, or rather move to enterprise sales and then increase prices. And I'll uh, talk more about why, why was it actually stupid, right? So one of the, one of the uh, reasons for this talk was actually that I considered that this is a stupid move, but was hard to move back. So I'm hoping to prevent others from making stupid moves. Uh, and at Bolt, of course, pricing is super critical. Uh, like Amazon, like other uh, similar providers, we kind of, uh, we want to prov provide the best deals uh, for our customers, and we want to provide the best earnings for our partners, which means that pricing is critical. And in fact, when I joined uh, Bolt, uh, like uh, there was not, uh, I didn't have yet uh, a lot of teams, so my first kind of job, the first thing I took over was pricing. The, like kind of my first couple of months was spent just getting our pricing strategy right and working out that kind of the, uh, fo focusing on that area because that, that was the most meaningful area, right? Okay, and one thing I want to talk about also is uh, what makes actually pricing uh, more important in the, uh, in the modern world, right? And uh, it's, actually, uh, it's actually becoming more and more important because uh, historically, uh, pricing was always kind of uh, secondary thought. Like if you went to a VC, you're raising fund, and you're like, well, what's your differentiation? You know, like you, you have a product, you're pitching it to the VC, and you say, well, my differentiation is that my product is three times cheaper than the competition, and the VC is just like, no. Like, right, that was not a differentiation. And so uh, historically, it was always like a secondary thing, and the primary thing was always like, okay, what's your competitive mode? How are you going to defend yourself? Right, and I'll talk a lot about that as well, but we also, we're experiencing this... Uh, the, the end of the paradigm shift where we kind of went, because a tech company, you know, it became a new thing, like kind of, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, where there was such a massive shift first, computers, networks, internet, like there were so many massive sh tectonic shifts in how business is done, that a new class of companies came to be, right? And we're coming to, slowly coming to an end. It's not like a binary end, but more and more usual companies are becoming tech companies, and more and more tech companies act as usual companies. So the the difference is eroding. And like some very interesting examples I see is like there's a, a Twilio, which is like a very big, very nice company, communication platform company, which made a bet on their competitive mode that they have a great experience for software engineers, right? They have great APIs, a great platform, great metrics. And for a while it worked, but now I think, you know, there are guys like Infobeep, which are betting that in the end this is a commodity service. And, you know, and in the end nobody will play uh, one dollar if you can pay 30 cents because they're slightly better APIs, right? So, 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 so this mode is eroding. And this, this is going to be very simple, interesting. And the same like Stripe versus Sidian. So it will be incredibly interesting to see how this plays out over the next uh, decade. And, and so long term, really, we're again in a place where in normal business, uh, long term, if it's possible to undercut you on pricing, somebody will undercut you on pricing, right? At least in efficient markets. And, uh, and this is also, this is something you always need to understand in context that what I say applies to, place, uh, to markets where products are sold for money, right? Not alternatively monetized, right? Because otherwise there's no point for pricing. And mostly I, st I speak still about more or less efficient markets, which is where you basically, you know, what are the alternative prices, right? Because there are markets like where it's really hidden, like, oh, there are very efficient markets like stock exchanges where you know what everything is priced at always, right? So there's a whole continuum there. And startup ecosystem is still very mature. Like we, we still at beginning ages. When I had Bolt, when I was like kind of trying to put a pricing strategy and trying to understand, I basically ignored all of our competition and instead I look at retail guys. I looked at Walmarts of the world and so on and Sam's Clubs because they've been doing it for like a hundred years. They've been having this ruthless pricing competition. So I wanted to just learn from them. How do they do that? What is what they approach? And so they, they had much more to learn from them than I had to learn from other startups. So this is something to also understand that if you want to learn from someone, don't look at tech companies, look at others, because the humans have remained the same. Humans want the same thing. Business fundamentals have actually remained the same. Some very specific things have changed and you can account for them. And uh, as an angel investor, at least five companies which I invested into is purely based on their approach to pricing. So let, first let's high level talk about price structure and then let's talk about the price itself. Uh, so high level there's like kind of different ways you can structure the price of consumption, transactional, uh, subscription, uplift sharing. Uh, 
but what I want to talk is actually subscriptions. Uh, why do I want to talk mainly about subscriptions is because there's a big bias in VC world to subscriptions. And uh, it's a very tiring bias. Uh, and I've been kind of arguing it a lot over my time, so I just want to explain it because this, I think subscriptions in the, again, in the kind of tech company world is the most misunderstood things. And there are places where subscriptions are perfectly reasonable and there are places where they're not. So talking about some myths, uh, one of the myths that persists is that persi somehow uh, subscription is somehow more predictable. It is not. Your users will either buy your service or they won't buy your service. How you structure the pricing doesn't ch fundamentally change it. The only, the only subscriptions that are more predictable is maybe they, uh, you, you create like churn events at longer term. Like for example, annual subscriptions, obviously you'll just kind of prolong your churn, but there'll be still churn. It won't, it won't matter, right? It, if, if they're paying, like Amazon famously in AWS unbundled because previously you paid for server, you rented it by month and you pay as you go and it was actually great, right? And it was, it's actually more predictable like that in many ways. Uh, and in reality, uh, the, the, the kind of the counterweight to this predictability is actually ability to optimize, right? So again, looking at AWS, uh, like the best part about it is that I have full control over the costs and I can do optimizations. So if I can literally figure out, okay, how can I reduce my AWS bill by 20%? If it was a subscription, I wouldn't have any control, right? So this control is actually very, very valuable for users and subscriptions can take it away. Um, and then the other thing, and the same for consumers, like a very nice example there is like uh, scooter passes, like, you know, everybody uses scooters, no, e-scooters nowadays, and you can either pay by minute or you can buy a pass. Uh, and pass sounds great from the point that uh, that, that kind of I get a fixed price, but at the same time, uh, and I'll talk about the unit economics of those are very shaky. And if, you, if you, I would actually charge you only a monthly price, if I would give you an alternative consumption-based price, then actually I would take away your ability to optimize that price. Anyway, so the important lesson to learn here is that you need to align with the business and customer fundamentals first, you know, and sell it to investors, not the other way around. Investors are rarely smarter than you. Well, at least, they, actually, to say it more correctly, there are definitely investors who are smarter than you, but nobody, they will never know your market better than you. If they know your market better than you, something is really, really wrong in that equation. Um, and then the, kind of the, the, thing to, the final thing to understand about subscription uh, fundamentals is that subscriptions work really well if your business is mainly driven either by fixed costs or by dis decreasing variable costs, right? Uh, why is that? Well, uh, be, be, because basically, if, uh, if you, uh, be, uh, mainly because of elasticity of demand. So a classical example, like long time ago at Bolt when I started, we kind of discussed why don't we do an unlimited subscription, right? Like it's very, like we just sell, sell a pass for some money and you can ride as much as you want. Well, the problem is uh, that the guy, the, the elasticity of demand here is massive. So a person who now does four rides a month will now be doing 40. Because essentially it's unlimited, all of the, like there will be no calculation. Like every incremental ride is now free for them, but it costs money for us, right? So for us to, for us to make money on that, it's like, would be really, really hard. We'd have to price it like, in, like basically at the top of the market. And it's like, and it's, it's basically pointless. Like instead we can just uh, uh, pay pay trip, right? And this, this is similar in other places where the where subscriptions work really well, like where fixed costs dominate, like software or software as a service. Right, you have a fixed cost. It mainly research and development support, like kind of like relatively fixed uh, costs, which scale, kind of scale slower uh, usually than the the software. At the same point, at the same uh, time, kind of the rental, uh, the rental way, the subscription is really aligned with with how users get value. They get value over time because if you stop updating your software, it starts decaying. Right, this is kind of natural thing. Uh, in, in the software engineering world, so so the, so it's it's like super aligned. It's super aligned with on every stage, right? And it took some time for for maybe to understand it for everybody, but once I understood, that was clear. Uh, then the other great places were cost scale with size. So if Netflix pays uh, uh, pays basically a fixed amount per movie they license or per per series, right? And every incremental subscriber that movie becomes cheaper and cheaper on them on a relative base, basis, right? So the more subscribers they spread it over, the cheaper each subscriber pays for each of the movies. Uh, Spotify, it's a bit, uh, it'd be trickier, but what they have is that the more subscribers they have, the better deals they can negotiate uh, with the music labels. So again, over time, the costs uh, uh, scale down. And, um, and then the, the, the last cl kind of classical example is when variable costs are unevenly spread. So like insurance, basically insurance-like products, right? Like if you have like either extreme events, either over time or over population, then it's like where subscriptions works really well. 
Anyway, and uh, finally, fi finally on subscription, just to kind of, as a final illustration, very often Amazon Prime is brought as an example of, hey, this is subscription working really well. But if you look how it's structured, then everything, they, they structured really smartly and very, very, very misunderstood that all of the stuff that they include into Amazon Prime, it's either a fixed cost for them. Uh, honestly, two-day delivery, I think it was not a cost for them at all. They literally prioritized something. It, it just was a, it, it's a prioritization engine in the software. I don't even know if it cost them anything. Maybe some minor incremental cost, right? Because something has to ship first, and, and they just basically prioritize the, the prime stuff. Uh, now, now it's probably more cost, but now they optimize to the point where like, almost everything can get to two-day delivery if it's fulfilled by Amazon. So, and then like music, video, photo storage, this all either fixed costs or like decreasing variable costs. So it's really aligned with that model, and that's why it works so well. Okay, so this is about price structure and specifically about subscriptions. Let's talk about the actual price value. So uh, scary, uh, scary formula on the, uh, on the, on the slide. Uh, we're going to take it one at a time. So there's three dimensions to pricing. The user dimension, the business dimension, and the channel dimension, right? Uh, and let's just take them one at a time, and I'll come back where this, they all display together. So let's start with user. Uh, basically, two very easy uh, things. Uh, like your value proposition should be higher than the competitor value proposition, and or your pricing should be better than competitor pricing, right? So together, kind of the combined difference, it's called, kind of called the whatever, customer surplus, should be better than the competition. Otherwise, why would somebody use your product, right? If you're not creating more value than competition, nobody will use your product. They will use a competitive product. So that's the first part. But also, uh, the important bit, and actually what I want to talk more about, is switching cost. So it's not enough to create more value uh, than the competition because uh, they, there's also a switching cost. And switching cost can be a habit, like, the, like people build up a habit. It's, it can be a lack of confidence, like they don't know that you create that value, you need to educate them, and so on. And, um, and it it's almost always exists and almost always underestimated, right? So people rarely think in terms, okay, uh, like they often think in terms, how am I better than competition, but they don't think, okay, it's not enough to be better than competition, I also need to overcome a switching cost, right? And uh, very often the, the people tend in terms of activities like activation, onboarding, and so on, but they don't think abstractly about, okay, this is why I'm doing all those things, is because there's a switching cost to move from competitor product to my product, or even, by the way, from nothing to my product, right? So you, there's rarely nothing, there's always some competition like, you know, even, the, like, uh, even if you don't think about it as competition, there's something that people do somehow how they achieve their goals right now, and this is your competition. And uh, the good news in the consumer world, in price consumer world, not alternatively monetized consumer world, you can very often uh, solve this through activation incentives, through trials, through onboardings, kind of through education. Uh, and uh, it's, it's actually why almost every, you know, Whatever service you use will have some free deliveries or, or free food. Um, and the important bit to understand there uh, that also that it's not uh, like switching cost is not a one-time thing, right? It's not enough to get the user registered. It's not enough to get them to do a first transaction. You, they need to build a habit. They need to basically, or they need to be bought into your value proposition or something. So you need to be sure, okay, you basically bring them to the same level as other users of your platform, right? And this, this, this you have to somehow sponsor. This is a separate part. Like I just call it overcoming switching cost. And, and, and it consists of many different activities, right? And in B2B, it's like, it's, 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 it's very often negotiation, getting buy-in within the organization, doing pilots, you know, doing contract, clever contracting, do, giving stuff for free, like basically. But, but it's all again the same. It's always overcoming switching costs. And it's really, really important to, uh, to keep that in mind. So this is the user part. It's actually relatively easy. Uh, business part is a bit trickier. Uh, so uh, a so few concepts here, right? So th this, this is basically, it, it's just like if you look at the, at your, at the unit economics, then this is what it's going to be. There's going to be costs, right? There's going to be profit. And, uh, and I just separate profit into two parts. I separate profit into the minimal profit, so the minimum amount you can charge, and then the mode premium. And, and of course, price in the end will equal that, right? It's just logical that the price is your, basically your revenue, and the revenue, one way or the other, will separate it to costs and profits. Uh, and like I think for the longest time, the theory was that uh, a good tech company, like, kinda doesn't really doesn't really have to worry about that. That like you, you get your revenues on one side, you get your costs on the other, and if they connect, that's great. But like, who cares, right? And you know, and this uh, Google and Facebook 
like Google specifically, you know, the search engine, which is the primary product, is on one side, which is the cost driver, and the advertisement, which is on uh, the, rev the revenue driver, is kind of on the other side, and they, 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 they're very loosely connected, actually, right? So the cost and the revenue is kind of like, they, they could scale the revenue 20 times, and probably the cost could stay the same if they wanted to, because there's no, like, uh, th there's no strong kind of connection that every indi uh, that every next like search query has some kind of like cost structure there, right? Uh, but we're, they, but this only happens when this mode premium dominates, and I, I'm going to talk about mode premium quite a bit. So we'll get to that. But today, more and more businesses, again, are normal businesses which compete, which are in tight competition, which don't have those strong modes. So let's let's take now this uh, this equation kind of one bit at a time, right? Uh, so the first one is uh, I start with maybe minimal profit. Uh, what do I mean by minimal profit? It's very much defined. Uh, so, and it's quite interesting, actually. Minimal profit is defined by the uh, willingness of investors to invest, put money in your company. For them to put money in your company, they need to get a return. A, t a minimal expectation of return in a private equity company, like when I invest into equity, like I'm as an investor, is at least 15%. That's, that's still quite low, but that's like the minimum, right? So th this kind of directly defines your, pro uh, pro uh, uh, your profit from the point that if you uh, raise a million dollar, with that million, you can create three millions worth of business. Then the minimum, uh, the minimum viable kind of profit margin on that business is five percent. If it's anything less than that, then you're already kind of you're not competitive on the investment market. So this is the minimum, right? It's, it's not it's not suggested. It's just the minimum where you start from. Uh, the other thing that I think is uh, the important component is costs, and uh, I think what uh, I think what is not getting enough attention uh, from entrepreneurs is uh, understanding your return of investment model. So uh, surprisingly few can tell me, like uh, there, there's a lot of uh, activity on kind of the micro level, uh, which is okay, uh, what is our user acquisition cost, what is our user lifetime, what is user lifetime value, but uh, less an understanding on the macro level, okay, I, I, if I invest a million dollars, how much business can we get, right? And, uh, and I would say that uh, this understanding your return and also understanding uh, when understanding your return, a very important part is understand what is your return. Uh, very often I see projections over revenue, but the problem is that uh, revenue is not a stable metric. Revenue in one company is not the same as revenue in another company, right? And so it's hard to, like, it's, it's even uh, for entrepreneurs themselves hard to understand what is, like, kind of a good metric. Uh, and then uh, what I found is a good metric, a uh, good kind of divisor is uh, long-term projected net profit. If long-term you believe that you're going to get like 40% profit, then this is what you should use as, okay, this is our return. If it costs you me now, I don't know, $10 to acquire $5 in long-term projected profit, then this is like a 50% return. This is a pretty decent one, right? And, and it, it kind of helps you align with uh, w whether you, like, and again, it comes back to pricing because understanding your cost, projecting costs, and so on helps you set pricing as well. Um, Anyway, and uh, yeah, and then like just again being mindful of your fixed costs, being mindful of variable costs. This is all very basic, uh, I guess, uh, microeconomics 101. But uh, a a again, like I see, uh, I, I think we've created this bias in the industry that people are over focused on the kind of product side and vision and everything. And this is all great. But then also I see a lot of businesses which kind of compete very actively on the market and, and they don't pay enough attention to the other side of this, which is like norm normal, normal, boring old business stuff, right? So it's be I think it is becoming more important with time. All right, but let's talk about mode premium because I think that is uh, the most important uh, part of pricing. Uh, and, uh, and, and mode premium is, is, is basically what allows you to get disproportional returns to investors, right? Mode premiums is why investors are excited to invest into tech companies because, uh, and, and it's, it's um, and mode is, is anything that is an, your unfair advantage due to scale, right? So this is one thing that people forget. It's not an advantage when you're small. It's basically what is, what will become your advantage once you get big, right? Uh, and it, it, it essentially captures the part of your business that scales non-linearly with size or rather scales like, so, so the most classical example, economy of scale, right? So like when I'm, when I'm a billion company, I spend 100 million on R&D, uh, that's like 10% of, uh, of my whatever uh, re revenue. And then if I'm a 10 billion company and now I spend 200 million on research and development, then it's now only 2% of, uh, of my business, right? So now I have an 8% margin, which I can basically, for example, decrease my pricing by 8% and become like very hard to compete with because now everybody else has to somehow match those 8%, right? And th this is literally what I mean under mode. This is actually how modes realize themselves in pricing is that you can either, under, either 
have these proportional profits and invest them. Uh, and, and then you have a choice. Take out these proportional profits, invest them into bettering your software so that you would be, uh, sorry, bettering your business so you would be hard to compete with creating more value for the customer or invest them into uh, creating better pricing for the customer. But either, either way, you got, you're kind of much harder to compete with because you have that capacity. Uh, and there are different types of modes, of course. Right? So, uh, and, and, and I think one of the most important things a business has to do uh, 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 is to understand what are the non-linearities in the business models. What are the things that change as you grow, right? And uh, of course, there's, like I mentioned, economies of scale, but actually we more and more today understand that there are diseconomies of scale. So there's also like uh, the companies become less and less efficient as they grow bigger. Uh, classical modes is network effects, right? So the, uh, in social networks, every user you add adds value to every other user. Right? And replicating a network is, becomes prohibitively expensive because it's so, such an exponential, like right, the, the nonlinearity there is exponential, so replicating is quite hard. Market place critical mass is a classical one. So uh, if, you, if you know booking.com, you know, they basically have every hotel in the world. And now for me to, for me to build a competitive service, I not, somehow have to go and sign up every hotel in the world. But I can't get any demand. I can't get those hotels without, if I don't have the demand, right? If I don't have the bookings, and I can't get the bookings without the hotel. So getting that critical mass, marketplaces require critical mass to operate, under which it's really, really hard to operate, right? And getting to that critical mass is the nonlinearity that is in marketplaces. User data, you know, the reason why nobody can compete with Google is purely because it's very, they capture so much of the traffic that their models are so much better than everybody else's that basically nobody can kind of undercut them on that. And so it's, it's become, so a classical, a classical example of mode is this chicken and egg, right? If only I would have X, I could do Y, but I can't get, uh, I can't get X without the Y, right? And this is like classical modes. Uh, negotiation leverage, uh, very hot in US to compete with Amazon uh, unless you're already super big on e-commerce because uh, they will have the best pricing out of everybody because they can buy things at such volumes that they can negotiate amazing like pricing, right? And then they basically can uh, return that to you. And of course, vendor lock-in and so on. So there's an there's a interesting book about that, which is called The Seven Powers. I, 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 I don't think it's the, the best it can be, but it's quite good. And like, uh, I, I kind of read it also uh, when, when preparing for this talk. Uh, and, and like, but generally, I do think that understanding the nonlinearities in your business is one of the most important things to do because this is uh, like if you can understand it, if you can capture it, if you can show it to investors, I think the many investment theses become like much easier, right? So, they, but like, what is like, and 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 this is probably the most interesting part of this kind of pricing. Uh, okay, uh, and so a final piece of pricing is the channel, right? So you, now you have a great user proposition, you have a uh, decent business, you're confident of your moat, you're confident of how much kind of, you're confident both that you can offer a good value to the uh, competition, and you're also confident that your business can be protected, right? Uh, that your business is, is solid. Uh, and then you lo should look at the channel, and, and uh, I think the most important bit to think about the channel is that you should look at it last. Uh, what I have done historically, and what I think is also a mistake from others, is that people very often start from the channel. They're like, okay, I can only do that with sales, so if I can only do it with sales, then I have to price my product to be like at this level, because otherwise it won't pay for sales, right? Because basically, uh, kind of your cost of customer acquisition, since, e since every acquired customer has to create a good return, then your cost of customer acquisition defines your pricing, or, or is defined by pricing, right? So they're really connected. And I think it's super important to first understand the fundamentals of your market, your users, and your business, and then figure out the channel, and not start like, okay, I'm going to build a self-service, self and then, you know, and then start from that assumption, and then build, and then kind of build everything else. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's actually like kind of the mistake I made historically, where in my company we had a really nice self-service organic kind of business, and we introduced sales. That sales eventually drove the pricing up, and I think it moved us. Like kinda, it kind of nerfed our value proposition and our unit economics to a point and moved us to a segment which was like completely, like I would say, different and with which we didn't have that much experience. And in the end, it was like probably not, a, not the smartest move, even though it wasn't, you know, I, I, I didn't understand that at the time. I understood it much later. So coming back, just a summary of what we talked about. Be careful with subscriptions, right? Uh, it's just a, a lot, I think they're still overused and overhyped. Uh, there are places where they work really well, but they're a tool, you know, they're, they're, they're a hammer, there needs to be nails, 
when there's nails, they work really well. When there's screws, then you know, not so well. Uh, and when there's uh, light bulbs, then not well at all. Uh, and, uh, and then think about the user, think about the value proposition you create, think about the switching cost, understand your unit economics, try to understand the nonlinearities in your business so you can adequately understand what, is, what can you protect long term, right? And because this informs kind of the minimal pricing you can offer. Because if you can offer like twice better pricing than competition and you're confident that this is the best business model and this is what you can protect long term and you think that like anyway, the, like basically that the market will anyway move there, so it's just a matter of time, then it's always smart to go there faster because you're so much increasing the value proposition to user, right? And, and then finally, once you understand those, try to figure out your channel so that you're not overspending on your channel and driving your pricing. And that is it. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.